afternoon, we, in the Catechism, will look at the beginning of the explanation of the sacraments in Lord's Day 25. And Lord's Day 25 teaches us in a general way what the sacraments are, holy, visible signs and seals. And in connection with the teaching of the Catechism, we'll read from God's Word from Exodus, and then also from Romans, Exodus chapter 12, we'll read verse 1 to 28. <clears throat> and Exodus 12 is about one of the Old Testament sacraments, the Passover, which is fulfilled in our Lord Jesus and replaced in the Lord's Supper. We can learn a lot about the sacraments as we look at the Passover as a sign and seal of God's favor. Exodus 12, coming after the plagues that God has sent on the land, Pharaoh is finally ready to release the Israelites to go to their new land, the promised land. We begin in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days, but what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout their generations as a statute forever. In the first month, from the fourteenth day of the month that evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places you shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. 
for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. <clears throat> and we turn as well to the New Testament and to Romans chapter 4. Romans 4, 9 to 25. Paul has been talking about the righteousness that is by faith and not by works. Referring to Abraham as the father of believers. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the seal of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. This is God's word. I was asked to preach on the next Lord's Day in order, Lord's Day 25 of the Catechism. We turn to Lord's Day 25. Lord's Day 24 taught us the importance of faith. We're not saved by our good works, but by faith alone in Christ. Lord's Day 25 continues from that, asking about where faith comes from. Since then, faith alone makes a share in Christ and all his benefits. Where does this faith come from? From the Holy Spirit, who works it in our hearts by the preaching of the gospel 
and strengthens it by the use of the sacraments. What are the sacraments? The sacraments are holy, visible signs and seals. They were instituted by God so that by their use, he might the more fully declare and seal to us the promise of the gospel. And this is the promise that God graciously grants us forgiveness of sins and everlasting life because of the one sacrifice of Christ accomplished on the cross. Are both the word and the sacraments then intended to focus our faith on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross as the only ground of our salvation? Yes, indeed. The Holy Spirit teaches us in the gospel and assures us by the sacraments that our entire salvation rests on Christ's one sacrifice for us on the cross. How many sacraments has Christ instituted in the new covenant? Two, holy baptism and the holy supper. Beloved in Christ, the Lord Jesus once rebuked his disciples for being slow to believe. I think those words apply to us also. We're slow to believe. To believe. Not just God's promises, but other situations too. We hold back. Say a person tells us surprising news, makes a big claim. We're skeptical. Where's the proof? Tell me that it's true. Show me. It's probably fake news. It happens with the gospel too. Our faith in God can be weak, inconsistent, feeling strong and robust in our faith one day, the next day, later that same week, we're all but deflated. Sometimes a person goes through even periods of doubt when he says, what if it's all too good to be true? How can we know that the Bible is the only truth? Or we struggle at other times because it feels like God is, doesn't love us or like God isn't near us. Then there are those moments when we must depend on the Lord. We know we have to trust in God with our whole heart in times of trouble, and yet it seems so hard to really trust. Slow to believe. Thankfully, God knows this about us. He's a loving and a patient father, who teaches us his word, and we know his word is a pure word, like silver refined seven times, Psalm 12. And aware of our weaknesses, God seeks to strengthen our faith, to bolster it and build it up. He gives us opportunities where we can actually see his precious gospel with our own two eyes, confirms the greatness of his love for us, in a most memorable way. He pictures it plainly for us. That's what the sacraments are. Holy, visible signs and seals given by God to strengthen our faith. I preach God's word on that theme from Lord's Day 25. For fortifying our feeble faith, God gives sacraments. And we'll see that the sacraments are holy, they're signs, and they're seals. The sacraments are holy. Now, if we're not paying attention, we might skip over a key word in answer 66. When the catechism describes what the sacraments are, it says they are holy, visible signs and seals. And we should underline that word holy. It's not a bit of filler, a throwaway adjective. It carries an important meaning. The sacraments of God are holy. What does it mean to be holy. Maybe the catechism students can help us out. They would answer, well, to be holy is to be set apart. Set apart for a special purpose, like the dishes that you use only for Christmas dinner and Thanksgiving dinner. They are holy. They are set apart. Well, getting more specific, something holy is set apart by God and for God. It's no longer an everyday, ordinary thing, but something dedicated to 
God's service. We see that in the Old Testament. God made certain things holy. The temple was holy. The altar was holy. The incense was holy. It was all holy because God set these things apart for divine worship. They were so closely associated with the Lord that they had to be treated with the utmost reverence and care. So for the sacraments, actually the word sacrament means quite literally a holy thing, sacramentum in Latin. We don't find that word sacrament in the Bible, but the Bible clearly describes its reality. The the catechism says the sacraments were instituted by God. These rituals that we have, they are holy because they've been given us by God. Take one of the Old Testament sacraments, circumcision, for example. This was God's gift. After making a covenant with Abraham and his family, the Lord gave them the ceremony and the mark of circumcision. And the Lord said, this was to be a lasting sign in the flesh, an unforgettable emblem of dedication to God. Or consider the Passover in Exodus 12, Again, it was God who gave this meal to the Israelites. It was meant to help them recall their deliverance from Egypt. God said, this is what you shall do. God's gift. See, the same thing in the New Testament. The Catechism says that Christ has instituted the two sacraments. Christ instituted them. The church didn't. Christ did. First, the Lord's Supper, before Christ went to the cross, then baptism, just before Jesus ascended into heaven. By taking the time to institute them, even at these important moments, turning points of his life, the Lord drew our attention to the sacraments, just like the ark or the altar or the incense, just like circumcision or Passover, God gave baptism and Lord's Supper and he gave them for a special purpose. They are holy. That's how the Catechism describes them in answer 68. It uses that key word there even twice. How many sacraments has Christ instituted in the New Covenant? Two, holy baptism and the Holy Supper. That highlights the divine foundation of these two events and their important function. They come from God and they lead us back to God. And now think about who uses the sacraments. We use them, of course, but more vitally, God, the Holy Spirit, uses them. The Spirit employs the sacraments to do His work in the Church of Christ, sanctifying and transforming. That comes out in the first question of our Lord's Day. Where does faith come from? And the answer, from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit using the Holy Scriptures and the Holy Sacraments works in us a most holy faith. Through these two tools, the Spirit points our eyes in one direction, redirects us to one person because he is our life and our purpose, our one joy. The Spirit points us to Jesus Christ and the sacrifice which he accomplished on the cross. And so holy, it's not a big word, but it has massive implications. When God made something holy in the Old Testament, like the ark or the temple, we know that that thing had to be treated as holy, not something you could be careless or casual about. To treat a holy thing as unholy could be fatal. Just ask Nadab and Abihu, who brought unholy fire into God's presence at the tabernacle. Ask Uzzah, who put out his hand 
to touch that wobbling ark. Holiness can hurt. And so, beloved, consider carefully that God has given us what the Catechism calls holy baptism. Do we treat it as holy? We've all undergone the sacred ceremony even quite a few years ago. And once in a while, we should think about our baptism with some proper reflection. Sometimes we treat baptism like it's only meaningful for the infant or maybe for the parents. It's kind of like a birthday party for the newborn child. Everyone forgets it as soon as it's over. When there's baptism, we have our coffee social, give some special gifts, and then it's all forgotten. It's just a fading memory. But baptism, God says, remains a sign and seal far longer than that waters on our forehead. Even long after we've grown up and professed our faith. What does it mean that the water of baptism was once sprinkled on your little head? Do you still need washing today? Forgiveness and renewal? What does it mean that you once received the promises of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Is God, is He like us? And does He forget His promises? Does He withdraw His word? Or can you still count on them? And we know, of course, He has not forgotten. His words are holy, pure as silver, seven times refined. And of course, You and I need his promises. You need them every day. God's promises are our lifeline. To know that our whole life is secure in the hands of God. What a gift holy baptism is. Or what does it mean that God laid on you his holy obligations? That's part of the covenant too. It's part of the message of baptism Holy baptism comes with the call that you would devote your life to the Lord, that you'd be set apart like those special dishes, set apart for loving God, serving God. Is your baptism 20 years in the past or 55 years in the past, 80 years ago? Does that calling of God still apply to you? It does. God gave you holy work because you're a holy person. Is that how we live? Like we are people under obligation to God, enlisted into God's army. Or reflect on the Lord's Supper. It's something we share every few months. The Catechism says it is a holy supper. And we're all familiar with the idea that the elders have a job to guard its holiness. That's the elders' task. But what about the rest of us? Do we treat the supper as something that's actually holy? Something coming from God and leading us back to God? One way we can do that is by preparing ourselves for the sacrament. That we actually get ready for it in the right spirit. If you know that it's a holy meal, eaten in the presence of a holy God, meant to strengthen our holy faith, then you should get ready beforehand by considering your sinfulness. Before I go to the table, I should know my sins. And I should see how my sins always get in the way of communion with God. And our spirit at the Lord's Supper is confidence too. Not just humility because of sin, but confidence and joy. We have been forgiven in Christ. And then as we prepare to leave the table, we have this resolution firm in our mind. Now I want to serve God with thanksgiving for his abundant grace. It's a holy meal. 
that I've shared in. Like baptism is a holy washing of my life. The sacraments are holy and they are signs. Driving along the road, you often see signs. A few doors down from our house in Hamilton, for example, there's a simple sign. It just says, for sale. A passerby doesn't need to wonder what that simple sign means because signs are obvious. It points to a reality that's invisible to the eye. That simple for sale sign points to the fact that the homeowner is making his house available to anyone who wants to buy it. Come make me an offer. The sign says, this is where you will want to live. Or as another example, take the wedding ring on our finger. It's only a thin band of gold, but everyone knows what it means. It points to a deeper reality. The fact that we are married. That we're in a relationship of committed love. Well, that's how signs work in the Bible, too. In the Old Testament, we find quite a number of things that are described as signs. The mark on Cain's forehead after he killed his brother. That was a sign. Or the rainbow in the sky after the great flood. Or the scarlet cord of Rahab hung from Jericho's wall. Even the Sabbath day in the Old Testament is called a sign. And we look at all these different signs, they broadcast a different message. They have a variety of purposes. The sign of Cain protected him. Or in the case of the rainbow, the sign reminded. Or in the case of the scarlet cord, the sign identified. This was Rahab's house. None of those things are called sacraments, but they give a good hint about what the sacraments do. God gives a sign to confirm his words to remind us about his promises, to underline his truthfulness. In scripture, we see this on many occasions that when God makes an important promise, God likes to add a tangible sign. The fleece will be dry in the morning. The shadow of the sundial will go backwards. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son. Our gracious God gives a sign, makes his people even more sure that they can trust in him. Another example is in Romans 4 about Abraham receiving the sign of circumcision. Years before, God had established his covenant with Abraham and his children God had promised him great things. I'm going to give you land, descendants, protection, an everlasting inheritance. And God knows all that might have seemed too good to be true. So he gives circumcision. And he says, it will be a sign of the covenant that I have with you. A permanent mark in the flesh, circumcision, but it pointed to something else pointed to something unseen, the covenant between the Lord and his people. Don't you forget this, God said to Abraham, because I will never forget. Or consider Passover. The Israelites are about to leave the land of slavery. But before they do, they share a simple meal, lamb and bread and dipping sauce. And as with every sign that God gives, it wasn't about the meal as such. Like at the Lord's Supper, when we're told not to cling to the outward symbols of bread and wine. No, the Passover was announcing a more vital message to those who ate the meal. You can see that in all the different parts of the meal in Exodus 12, the Passover. Each element, each part of it speaks its own language. It all has a point. The shed blood of the lamb. 
speaks of how God atones for sin. Eating the roasted meat is a message of how the Israelites would share in their redemption. They would take it into themselves, internalize it, if you will. Having unleavened bread points to how they needed to put all sin out of their lives. That yeast of impurity, which always grows and spreads, put that away. And eating the bitter herbs, a reminder of all the bitterness of their years in Egypt. Every part had a message, a story to tell. The Passover meal was probably a strange thing to witness. And so the question that comes from the children is kind of expected when they would say, what do you mean by this service? In other words, what's going on? What's this all about, all these signs? And then the parents had to tell them about the exodus. God saving them. God delivered you. And don't you forget it. Passover was like the war monuments that we've put up over the years here in Canada. Places that you go and you ponder what soldiers in the past have done for peace. You look at it and you remember. Like that, the Passover was a memorial. A living memorial. Forever announcing, this is what God has done for you. This is what his word of promise can bring about when you trust in him. We have different sacraments today than they had in the Old Testament, but their character is the same. The Belgian Confession describes baptism and Lord's Supper as visible signs and seals of something internal and invisible. As signs, they point our gaze toward a higher truth. Look. See what God has done for you in Christ. Remember it and believe it. As this Lord's Day put it, the sacraments were instituted by God so that by their use, he might the more fully declare and seal to us the promise of the gospel. They're all about the gospel. The gospel that we don't always believe as firmly as we should Like we said, a person might sometimes question whether God really loves them. How can I be sure of the Father's love? Why doesn't it feel like I've been forgiven? Why doesn't it feel like God is answering my prayers right now? Why does God seem so far away? Here's where the sacraments have a message for us. They point us to the salvation that is ours in Christ. They declare to us, God does love his people. God does forgive sinners. He forgives you. Again and again, they reassure us that the gospel is a sure thing. In the same way that water cleanses dirt from our bodies, so Christ's blood cleanses us from all our sin. In the same way that the bread is broken and the wine is poured out, so Christ suffered and his blood was spilled in order to give us life. These signs, they make visible the essential lessons of the gospel. Sometimes Christians will hope to receive a sign from God Maybe you're seeking God's will in a difficult situation. Or maybe you're despairing of God's presence with you. We just want a sign. Something out of the ordinary. Something unusual. Something to show us without question that God does care for you. We have our signs already. In the sacraments. We have the plain and obvious signs of the most important thing we need to know, 
that we are loved by God, forgiven of all our sins, and adopted as his children. The sacraments are holy, they're signs, and they're seals. <clears throat> if you've ever bought something online, you might have seen a little symbol in the address bar at the top, a closed padlock. They say that's what you should look for. It indicates this is a secure website. Seeing it, you know you can put your credit card information on there and it won't be compromised. And for a long time, people have been using seals like that little padlock, sometimes with a wax blob and signet ring, sometimes with a fancy signature. It marks something as legit. A seal provides certainty, inspires confidence about whatever is inside. Well, in the same way, God calls the sacraments not just signs, but seals. Think of Romans 4, 11. It says, Abraham received the seal or the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. He's saying that mark in the flesh that Abraham got validated all the promises God had given. It showed him God's promises are worthy of his faith. They are the real deal. Abraham could be absolutely sure. He had God's word. He had the confirmation of God's word, the seal, as it were, the testimony that God's word was true. And the result for Abraham, Paul says, as a result of this, he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Romans 4.21, he was fully convinced, that's faith, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. He did not waver in faith, was strengthened, fully convinced in God, so sure because he had the sign and it was a seal the Bible calls us children of Abraham sons and daughters in faith and that means like Abraham we can be sure when we receive the gospel and when we receive the gospel sacraments we can be utterly convinced we're allowed to have an unwavering trust in God's promise Strengthened in faith, fully assured. For this is the promise, God says. The catechism sums it up that God graciously grants us forgiveness of sins and everlasting life because of the one sacrifice of Christ accomplished on the cross. That's the gospel that we see with our eyes in the sacraments and we taste it in our mouths. It is this real as surely as water washes away dirt from the body, so certainly Christ's blood and spirit wash away the impurity of my soul. It is this real. As surely as I taste with my mouth the bread and cup of the Lord as sure signs of the Lord's body and blood, so surely does Christ nourish and refresh my soul. You can be completely sure Years after the water is dried from our foreheads, the value of that sacrament remains. And though the aftertaste of the wine is long gone from our mouth, the comfort, it endures. We should remind ourselves of these living signs, these powerful markers, these testimonies to the Lord's grace. Don't ever forget this, God says. Don't ever forget it because I do not forget it. We can take that message with us each day. We can bring to mind the work of our Savior. As the Catechism reminds us, 
our entire salvation rests on Christ's one sacrifice for us on the cross. For our lives, beloved, nothing is more important than that truth. This good news of Christ's love, something we never have to doubt, that in Christ, God is faithful. He won't break his promises to you, and he will not go back on his word. In fears and anxieties, in sin and in guilt, in times of uncertainty, let Christ point you to himself again and again by his word and by the sacraments. Let's not be slow to believe, but quick to trust. God's word is sure. I will never leave you or forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. Rest always in him. And you will find your rest. Amen.